Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Milan Savic. And my name is Sara Pellegrini. And we are here today to share some unpleasant truths with you. Yes, indeed. Once upon a time, there was the monolith. It was heavy, it was uh, not really friendly, but also easy to deploy, easy to set up, easy to debug. All the components in a single deployable. And uh, during the years, the modern application has become more and more demanding in terms of high availability, flexibility, scalability. And uh, unfor unfortunately, not always, the monolith was able to keep up with these needs. Luckily, we live in 2022, and the universal answer to all of these problems are microservices, as we can see here. <laughs> so microservices represent um, basically a pattern that you uh, extract some functionality from your monolith service into se several microservices. Uh, they are really very defined. They do one thing, they do it really well. Uh, but in order to complete any meaningful business transaction, uh, they need to communicate with each other. In this case, we are going to see that our islands communicate using a boat. Uh, but although this looks really easy, it is not always like that. Yes, because if you look under the surface, the problem begins. Uh, indeed, dealing with the, micro with the distributed system in general uh, hides several challenges. And first of all, our challenges from the communication point of view among these uh, autonomous services. The network could be unstable. Uh, the other microservices could be temporarily unavailable. A lot of different problems that uh, uh, were not there when we were dealing with the monolith. So mm, the, in order to mm, deal with these uh, problems, we need to add a lot of complexity in our uh, systems. And the question here is, is it really worth it? And the answer depends. As you, know, as you all know, the very first question of the Fight Club and of the distributed systems is, you do not distribute your system. You, should really, you shouldn't really distribute your system if your architecture doesn't require you to, if your domain doesn't require you to, to do so. And today, we extracted two important topics in distributed systems. One is message dispatching, and the other one is data storage. More specifically, we extracted several challenges that these two topics impose, uh, and we also propose some solutions. Be aware that those are just something that we think are the most interesting to share today. Of course, not uh, everything. Yeah, dealing with the distributed system, the first challenge we need to face is to dispatch dispatch messages from uh, one component to another, right? And uh, we need to improve our business solution in order to make them more resilient to all the communication pitfalls that we can encounter. So to understand better the um, techniques that we are going to present, we want to introduce a sample use case that will accompany us during all the presentation. And uh, a user decides to purchase something on his favorite e-commerce. And this e-commerce is built through a distributed network of microservices. And each of them has its own responsibility, of course. When, for example, a user decides to confirm an order, a confirm order command is delivered to the right component. This component will verify the status of the order to see if the order can be, can be performed. And will publish an order confirmed events to all the other interested components. So these other components may react accordingly to their responsibilities. For example, this orange component can send an email to the customer. These uh, green components can update the status of the order on the database. And after that, the shipment department want to query our system in order to retrieve the confirmed orders and to ship them. So the point here is that uh, when we talk about um, message-driven system, we distinguish about different main kind of messages. And that's true. Uh, we should uh, uh, differentiate between several types of messages that we have in our system. And now we are going to see which uh, one we find interesting and what are the differences between those. So Sarah mentioned the very first one as a command. So command represents an intent to change something within our system. Uh, it usually does not have any response. So you expect from your system just to reply to you, okay, we accepted your command to execute or not. It is routed to a single handler. That's really important. The other type of messages that we have are events. 
They are routed to basically any interested parties. Um, usually we use PubSub, which is really uh, well known. And we do not care about uh, results of event handling. The, th the third type of messages that we have are queries. Uh, queries represent uh, basically inquiry for the information. They do have results, and here we are really interested in those results. They might be routed to a single ha handler or to several, several handlers, depending whether we want to scatter and gather our query and then collect uh, results. So we have our services. They are going to communicate using these messages, and it should be pretty trivial to do so, right? But there are some challenges, right? Yeah, indeed, a lot of things can go wrong. First of all, a message maybe is not delivered. So the first common problem that we need to, to face in distributed system is exactly uh, the message you are trying to send is not, uh, doesn't reach its destination. So the reason could, could be different, such as, for example, a network partition or uh, the component is uh, temporary unavailable. There is an outage. So um, let's say that our friends want to buy something uh, and um, Basically, it confirmed the order, and the system starts doing several activities. At a certain point, the system sends a, a request payment command to the payment service. So in normal situations, the request message will reach its destination, and as a consequence, the payment is performed, and a confirmation is sent back to the initial component. In less fortunate cases, uh, it is possible that the first component doesn't receive any confirmation. So uh, maybe the request is not arrived at uh, its destination, or maybe it took too long to be processed. Whatever the reason is, uh, what we can, try, we can do to alleviate this problem is to implement a retry mechanism that automatically, whenever after a certain time, the initial component didn't receive uh, any response, or when it received an uh, explicit error, it the infrastructure retry automatically to send the same message. So this is a first purely technical solution that we can use to tackle the problem of uh, undelivered message. You will notice that uh, we are using this um, symbol, this specific symbol in all the following slide, to identify all the technical solution that we will present. Uh, is it possible to um, refine this technique using, for example, uh, specific uh, retry strategy, for example, with incremental or exponential back-off. And now in front of us, we have another solution to this problem, which is called a circle breaker. And I'm telling this, although Sarah is here, she's not really a big fan of this solution. Uh, anyway, how it works is when we have our user that wants to do something within our system to buy some product, uh, we are going to request the payment. Uh, we are going to send that message to our payment provider. But due to various reasons, uh, that payment provider is not available. So what are we going to do in this case? We are going to break the circuit. And all the following request payment messages, commands, are basically going to fail right away. This way we are going to fail fast, so we are going to be more performant and more um, mindful in regard to resources. Uh, however, from time to time, we need to remember that this service, this payment provider might be available, so we have to contact it again. Uh, this circuit breaker is another solution that is purely technical. It doesn't have to do anything with the way how we design our, our system. Yes, and by evolving this concept further, it is possible to configure a failover mechanism. So in this case, when a certain component is not able to perform uh, its task, its duties, uh, what we can do is to automatically redirect basically all the requests the, that was addressed to the initial component to a second instance. The second instance maybe was already there and used, or maybe we can in instantiate this second instance on the fly to, to meet the temporary needs. So this is also another uh, solution, another strategy in, that we can use. And this is also purely technical, but uh, let's see now how we can tackle the problem of undelivered message under the uh, point of view of application design. So the solution that we can use here is setting a deadline. Uh, when you want to, in this case, request the payment, 
We can also set a deadline for how long we are okay with waiting for this response, for how long getting this response makes sense to us. So when we send that request and for some period of time we do not re receive the, the response, our timer will uh, tick, so payment deadline will occur. As a consequence, what we want to do is basically to compensate this order. So what are we going to do? We are going to cancel the order. This is a design solution, which we denote with this symbol here. Um, it is designed because it really depends on the domain that we are working in. Uh, if um, we are, for example, in some banking domain where transactions really need to be fast, waiting longer than a second might not be suitable for us, while waiting for, I know, invoice to be paid 30 days even is something completely fine. With this, we go to another challenge. Yeah. So message deliver multiple times. So here is another critical problem to consider when you distribute your system. And be in mind that uh, this problem uh, can also be caused by the retry mechanism that we discussed earlier. Indeed, in a distributed environment, it's basically impossible to distinguish uh, the reason of a failure of a certain request. It is possible that this request uh, never arrived at its destination, but it is also possible that it's correctly dispatched, is properly handled by the destination component, but the confirmation is not uh, arriving back to the initial one. So this uh, uh, is why it is very important that we build our components in such a way they can tolerate multiple sending of the same message. So a first solution to this problem is uh, to make your messages idempotent. So what does it mean? Uh, idempotence is um, a property of uh, some operation such that no matter how many times you execute them, you achieve always the same result. So let's see an example. Our friends want to buy a banana. And uh, before to confirm the order, he decided to better buy two bananas. So he want to add one other banana to the cart. So the system basically send this increment item number command and the command is executed, and the number of bananas goes from one to two. Perfect. So what happens if the command is uh, delivered twice by mistake? So the second time that the same command arrives, it is executed, and the number of bananas goes from two to three. This is not what we want. So the problem here is that increment item number is not an idempotent message. So let's see how we can uh, solve the same problem using idempotent messages. What we can do is basically to use a semantically different command that instead of increase the number of banana, basically it updates the number of item in the card. In this way, when the first command reaches the target components, it is executed, the number of bananas are updated from one to two. But when the same message is delivered the second time by mistake, it is not a problem because the number of bananas goes from two to two again. So this is a very powerful tool in distributed environments. And designing your message in order to make uh, their execution idempotent is the key to make uh, your application really robust. One other thing that we can do in this scenario is basically to check the current state. We have a command to confirm the order. Uh, we are going to fire up an order confirmed event. What is really convenient here is that naturally orders do have identities, right? So when we have a new command that is going to arrive for the same order, we already know that we confirmed them. So we can safely just reject it easily. Uh, we can add another solution to our toolbox. We call it here Compare and Swap. Uh, Compare and Swap is probably something that you all know from pr uh, program languages such as Java or C Sharp. Um, there it is purely technical solution while here we say it is a design solution because what we compare and what we swap, basically execute, uh, is really dependent on the domain that we are in. But what to do when naturally there is no an ident identity? Let's say that we have here uh, storage. We want to deliver two bananas from our storage. Uh, we are going to issue uh, remove items command. As a consequence, you're going to have event fired. You're going to update the state, but for some reason, we might receive the same command again. 
Naturally, as I said, bananas do not have any identity. They are the same in this context, right? <laughs> they are really the same. So what are we going to do? We are just going to fire the same event again, and then we are into an inconsistent state. But yeah. In this case, we do not have an identity in this uh, use case. So what we can do is to artificially introduce an identity in order to solve the problem. Basically, we can use the unique identifier of the commands. The commands is executed, and this unique identifier is basically saved into a temporary cache. In this way, we can avoid uh, the second execution of the say command, because when it arrives, we already know that it's already in the cache, and we just ignore it. So this technique is called uh, the duplication. And uh, it's the only technical solution, as you can see, that we propose for uh, this uh, problem of message delivered multiple times. And uh, you should uh, use this technique only when it is not possible to use one of the other solutions. So basically, when you do not have identity in the context that uh, you are uh, uh, developing. This challenge that we have in front of us is that messages could be delivered out of order. Uh, reasons for that could be that we are using underlying protocol that does not guarantee message delivery order, such as UDP, for example. But even if you are using protocols that guarantee message delivery order, uh, we might have a situation where we are communicating via several channels to the same component on which we have to synchronize the order. Anyway, uh, one of the solutions we are going to exercise on this example, which is pretty similar to all the others. So we want to send a confirm order, and then we want to request the payment. So first we send the confirm order, order is confirmed. Then we send request payment, and the payment is confirmed. This is pretty easy, right? But just by sending those messages one by one, due to network configuration or some other um, factors, messages could be received in different order than we expect them to be received. So payment is confirmed, and luckily for us, order is confirmed as well. So there is no problem, right? But what happens if order is not confirmed? For us, as we are uh, part of the online store, this is really good because we have uh, payment confirmed, so we got the money, but we didn't deliver goods. But for our customer, that's not so nice situation. And let's say that we want to be ethical and we want to solve this issue. So what we can do is basically to chain our messages. So Firstly, we are going to confirm the order, order. We wait for order confirmed reply to come to us. Then we request the payment, and the payment can be confirmed. So we are uh, really happy about this scenario. Again, a design solution really depends on the domain that we are dealing with. Yeah, and an alternative solution that maybe it looks similar but is different, is basically to force the order of the several phases in a business process, basically connecting them through a, a cause and effect mechanism. So let's see an example. The request to confirm basically an order is forwarded to a certain component. This component basically publish a order confirmed event and as a consequence of the order confirmed event, basically we send the payment request command that is uh, executed. So it is basically impossible that the payment is uh, um, executed before the order is confirmed because it's exactly the order confirmed events that trigger the publication of the next command. So this is uh, again another design solution Let's see now a solution, a strategy that we can use in very particular situations. And that is actually to be lenient in cases where we can, of course. Here in front of us, we have a scenario where we want just to read uh, some um, values from a temperature sensor. Maybe we want, we want to display it to a UI, or maybe we want to use it to make some decisions. Uh, if messages are received in the wrong order, and let's say that we have some condition depending on the barrier or the temperature that you want to trigger something, so if temperature goes up and down, if we receive messages out of order, it could happen that we trigger the procedure twice, which is not what we want. As a solution, what we can do is basically to introduce a, a time window in which we are going to collect that red values, and then we are going to use reduction function on those values. Here we used an average, could be anything, could be mean, whatever. 
and then we are going to treat that as the actual red value. Hopefully, based on that value, we can uh, make better decisions and we can overcome this issue of messages being received out of order. Again, a design solution because, because that reduction function really depends on domain, how we want to calculate uh, the, the value. But there are also technical solutions that we want to cover as well. Yeah, as Milan mentioned before, we may in certain situations take advantage of a protocol, a transport protocol that can uh, uh, guarantee the ordering of the messages. Indeed, in this example, for example, um, it is possible using a TCP channel to guarantee, to ensure the ordering of the messages that comes from uh, orange component to the blue component. But um, what can we do if we need to scale up the blue component with a second instance? In this case, we have two distinct channels. The two components are uh, operating concurrently, so it is not possible to guarantee the ordering, right? So a possible strategy here, a strategy here is uh, to uh, deliver all the messages that need to be executed sequentially to the same instance. So what we can do is to, for example, use a consistent hashing algorithm uh, using as a key uh, a property of the message that basically determines its uh, sequentiality. In the um, e-commerce uh, example, we can say uh, all the uh, messages that uh, have uh, even customer code are delivered to the first instance. All the messages that have odd customer codes are delivered to the second instance. So in this way, we can ensure the ordering um, when it's needed. Unfortunately, this solution is not always uh, something that we can use because what if, for example, instead of scale up the instances of the blue component, we want to split the blue component in two subcomponents, let's say a uh, black and uh, green components. So the black component will handle some kind of messages and the, orange, uh, the green component will handle other kind of messages. So if we have uh, the necessity to guarantee the ordering uh, between two messages that must necessarily be delivered to different components, these uh, TCP channels cannot help us. So basically, these technical solutions are good. We can take advantage of them, um, of uh, target uh, transport protocol, of uh, consistent hashing mechanism, but uh, they must always be uh, combined with the correct application design that can solve the problem of uh, uh, message delivery in wrong order at uh, the business logic level. Okay, now what to do when non-functional requirements change? Let's say that in this monolith application we want to extract a red component. We may extract it because we have a different team that wants to develop this component. They want to have a completely separate GitHub repository. They want to have their own build cycles, deploy cycles, et cetera, et cetera. Or we just want to differently scale this red component. So why to scale the whole uh, service when we can extract only one component? But what we also want to ensure is basically when we extract this component, that our business logic stays the same. So we don't want to impact our business just by having non-functional requirements. Uh, the technique that can really help us with this is called location transparency. Yeah. So location transparency is a technique that basically requires that all components are not aware of the physical location of all the other components they interact with. Even more, it's better that a component is not even aware of the existence of other components. So a component can uh, express, uh, share uh, its need with the rest of the world sending a command, or can express, share affect uh, with the rest of the world sending an, ev uh, an event, yes. But it, it is not aware of the, um, who will uh, be interested in these uh, messages. A uh, way to solve it, or let's first talk b before how we can communicate between components. Let's say that purple component wants to send messages to blue component. It can use a direct approach, so it knows its location, knows its IP, and it just sends messages direct, directly to it. However, with this, we are building tightly coupling. Components have to know about themselves, so we cannot be really location transparent. 
extracting components from this system is really painful because we have to change a lot of code. What we can do is to introduce an infrastructural component uh, that we are going to call a um, message bus. This component will abstract away uh, basically the existence of all other components. What we know are the messages, which in this case represent the API of our system. So purple component just know that there is a certain command or certain event that exists that can be handled by someone who we do not care just. Uh, Using infrastructural components such as message bus will give us also possibility to have a clear boundaries of our, of our system. Uh, and we can design better inside those boundaries. We can use this bus to deliver messages. And now when we want to separate our service into several smaller services, uh, we can just change the implementation of the bus. Yeah, indeed, this is a very powerful technique because allows us to evolve our deployment strategy without touching a line of uh, business logic. So um, very likely when you start a new project, you don't want to deal with the, uh, the complexity of distributed system right now, right? So probably the most logical thing to do is to deploy all components into a single deployable, a well-structured monolith that contains inside all the different components. In this first stage, uh, the components can communicate each other using a message bus that basically deliver, is able to deliver the messages inside the same executable. So um, after some time, when the need arises, uh, you can separate the red component uh, in, a, in a distinct deployable, right? So you can scale it up. Uh, and um, at this point, of course, the yellow message bus is not suitable anymore because it is able to dispatch messages only inside the same executable. So what the only thing we need to do is uh, to change the implementation of the message bus with one that is able basically to, to dispatch messages across distributed components without touching any line of code. So location transparency, uh, it's uh, basically uh, start with the definition of the correct API that are able to create a complete uh, the coupling uh, between the business logic and the infrastructure that basically deliver messages, the message bus. And uh, in this way, whenever the need arise, um, we can uh, evolve uh, the implementation of the message bus without touching the business logic. Performance, something that we care only at the end of our project. We do not care about that at the beginning, but sometimes we should. Bad performance could be caused by, I don't know, maybe there is a heavy load on our system. Um, maybe we are just experiencing certain performance degradation on our machines. Um, or the process itself is slow in its nature. We can communicate with our components sending messages in a request reply fashion. So we send a request, we receive a reply. This will uh, sequentialize a bit our communication and it will have a lot of impact on our performance. What we can do is to start streaming our requests and start receiving response also in a stream way. Of course, we need to build a correlation between requests and response. However, this will have a really big impact on our communication and also on our uh, performance. Uh, streaming design solution, why? Because it starts with a good API. Uh, if you design your APIs in a streamable fashion, uh, then you're more, how to say, more flexible in future. However, it does not end there. If underlying protocols do not support streaming, our performances are going to be, again, bad. But at least we have a good starting point and just changing the infrastructural component, the technical aspect of how we communicate can have a really, really big impact. Yeah, but not all that glitter is gold. And uh, while sending, of course, messages in a continuous stream can uh, 
uh, improve, can speed up our system, it is also important to guarantee that all the uh, components that are in the pipeline are able to, to support the, the speed of incoming message, the pace of incoming message, right, this rhythm. Because if this doesn't, doesn't happen, the consequences are pretty clear, are pretty obvious. So we can identify this kind of problem with the name of impedance mismatch. And uh, let's say that a certain component that maybe is not particularly performant needs to manage a higher load than expected. So what it can do, it can buffer the messages that need to, to be handled for some time. But uh, unfortunately, if this situation um, continues for too long, the component will end up collapsing, right? So in this case, what we can do to prevent this is to use a back pressure mechanism. So back pressure basically um, guarantees you that it's not the first component that pushes, but is the second one that pulls. So determine the pace of the incoming messages. So this is a powerful tool when uh, we are dealing with stream, but uh, remember that uh, slowing down is not always a good solution, depending on uh, the business case. So for example, in the stock ex exchange market, probably it's better to crash than to slow down in some cases, right? Uh, batching, I guess that this is known to all of us. It's really simple, I would say. But anyway, we're just going to quickly iterate over it. So instead of sending a single message, we are going to uh, accumulate several messages in a batch, and we are going to send the whole batch. Uh, with this, we are going to reduce the footprint that we have on the wire, uh, because we are going to meet headers for each and every message, but we are going to uh, send only headers for the whole batch metadata, all that, uh, how to say, uh, noise around the message that is needed for the transport uh, can be sent only once in a batch. This way, we are just going to improve performances by itself. Uh, this is a technical solution in a streaming, under the streaming umbrella. Uh, with this, we are done with uh, message dispatching a part of our talk. So now we are going to move to data storage, uh, which is something that we nowadays take for granted. However, challenges uh, of distributing data storage are really, really important. And at least we should be aware of them if we do not need to solve them by ourselves. The very first one is data availability. And we know that today data is gold. And then we want our data to be always available because we need to make decisions uh, frequently. The first thing that we can do about uh, making our data available is? Yeah. So when data are stored in a single database, the risk is to have a single point of failure. So when the instance is not available, the data are not accessible either. And what we can do is uh, to instead of storing in a single instance, basically to replicate the data uh, across multiple instances. Uh, so that if one of them is not uh, accessible, it's not available, you can connect to the, another one. And uh, however, replicating data across distributed system, ensuring the consistency uh, among all these instances is not a trivial operation. Luckily for us, there are people who think about this <laughs> and they invent protocols. In um, our case, they are called distributed consensus protocols. And I'm just briefly going to explain to you how they work in general. Usually we have a client that wants to store some data to a server. Uh, it picks one server, which is usually a leader. It is either a leader for a cluster or for that specific transaction that depends on the protocol that we are using. Uh, the leader will write that data into its transaction log. Then it will replicate uh, that information to other nodes in a cluster. Once a certain number of nodes acknowledge that transaction, then we can consider this information to be committed. When we say that it is committed, basically means that from this point on, as long as our cluster is available, that information is going to be available in the cluster. When it is committed, then we can safely apply it to the state machine and reply back to the client saying, okay, this is durably stored. Uh, knowing the fact that all servers have the same transaction log, they all have the same state machine, which is deterministic, basically leads us to conclusion that all nodes in a cluster are going to come to the same uh, state eventually. Hence, we are going to replicate our data successfully. 
Yeah, and uh, among the several distributed uh, consensus protocol, uh, the one we have chosen for our implementation is Raft, and this is mainly because of its understandability. So basically, Raft is a uh, protocol that is based on absolute majority of the node in the cluster. You need the majority both for the leader election and for acknowledgement of new data that are written. And um, yeah, so in this case, if you use RAF, uh, in order to have the cluster available, you always need the majority of nodes available. And yes, in this case, uh, our uh, Swiss Army knife has one only blade because uh, when it comes to data availability, the only solution, the only strategy is uh, precisely to replicate data on multiple instances. Uh, performance, again, me talking about performance. So reasons uh, are basically the same as for message dispatching. Uh, one of the solutions that we can propose here is to layer our storage. Here in this case, we have a primary and secondary storage. Uh, primary storage is something that is usually deployed to fast machines that have fast SSDs while secondary storage is something that is deployed to um, slow machines. When we want to store our data to, to the cluster, firstly we send it to the primary storage, then the primary storage is going to replicate it to the secondary storage. We continue to do that. Information is replicated, but after a certain time we can say that primary storage, because it has much slower disk, we want to be cost effective here, we can just start deleting old data. Why? Because it is uh, present in the secondary layer. Why do we do that uh, in the first place? It's because usually we want to access the most recent data. If for some reason we want to access the, um, the data that is not part of the primary system, we can still do that with a little performance uh, penalty. But overall performance is improved. So we have a smaller cost for our cluster and performance is still okay for the recent data. Uh, what I forgot to say is that in uh, uh, data storage, all solutions that we have are purely technical because data storage is something that is really general uh, and there we cannot uh, have our design impact on any of the fallacies that we have in data storage. So all solutions that we have here are purely technical. Yeah, and um, when it, if your need is uh, to um, have a, a high load in terms of a reading, a reading operation, one effective solution is basically to scale up the instances of uh, uh, your store, your database, and um, you can do that because, of course, as we said previously, the data replicates across instances, so the information are available everywhere. And um, unfortunately. Uh, this is not uh, the same uh, for writing operations, so this solution is not effective for writing if you use Raft protocol. So why is that? Because in Raft, uh, in order to write uh, something new, you need to pass through the leader, you need to have acknowledgement from the majority uh, of the node in the cluster, so this operation uh, will not be able to benefit from the increased number of nodes. But if you, if you want to read a lot, you can increase the number of instances, yeah. And this is another um, horizontal scalability tool that we can use in order to improve performances. Something again that is a little bit obvious because when we shard our data, basically means that we are going to have a substream of the whole stream. So a server is going to have less data, essentially will lead us to better performance. Uh, how to do it is basically each server is going to know how to calculate the sharding key and it will know to which node to write, uh, redirect the data. If the sharding key says, okay, this is your data, then I'm just going to accept it and store it. If not, then I am going to uh, dispatch to a server where it uh, belongs. Another solution that we have uh, here is sharding. With this, we are done with all challenges and all solutions. <laughs> and now we want to give you something to take away. Yeah, because um, we have seen many techniques for several different problems, but there is a common denominator, a sort of general rule, something that for us uh, uh, is very important when uh, you implement distributed system. Yeah, so we have seen two groups of solutions. One are technical solutions, while the others are uh, design solutions. What we want you to leave 
COVID is basically that not always a technical solution is the best one. We as developers usually try to seek for the technical solution because this is what we are accustomed. We don't want to talk to our business to see whether we can do something in our design to improve uh, our uh, solution. Besides uh, uh, choosing the design solution, we can also be... Be, be very reactive, yes, because uh, uh, in distributed system is very important. Be reactive is uh, a way of life, but uh, today we want to uh, basically remember the first three reactive principles. First of all, stay responsive, so embrace the asynchronous approach, not only when you handle the expected the scenario, the happy part, but uh, most of all when you basically are detecting and dealing with the problem, with errors. And we want to accept uncertainty. When we are in single, single deployable units, it is easy to, to send messages, right? Uh, everything is here. But once we want to uh, pass that uh, border of, of single deployable unit where we want to send messages over the wire, then everything becomes a possibility. Anything can fail. Messages could be delivered several times, uh, could not be delivered at all, etc., etc. So we must accept that uncertain, uh, uncertainty and design our system in that manner. Now, and finally, connected with the previous one, embrace the failure, because uh, when you are dealing with distributed system, the failure is not uh, an exceptional condition. It's uh, just one of the many situations that you need to deal with. So it is very important that uh, failure is uh, explicitly represented and handled in our application. And that's all. Yeah, so this is part for questions. You can ask them now, we can start discussion, or this is where you can reach us. Yeah, yeah so go ahead. If you